Hi. I want to tell you about my irrigation system, but it's kind of hard to do unless I just talk to you about the evolution of Happy Dog Farm because the irrigation system is what helped Happy Dog Farm grow. So, and all the mistakes I've made and everything else, they're all kind of relevant. So I'm just going to tell you the story and you'll see it and then hopefully you'll get a better idea of what it's about. So um, in, in the beginning there was Happy Dog Farm and there really was no farm. Where the orchards are now was just fields that I mowed down and they were filled with weeds and I started getting them ready to plant trees. So we didn't own all the property where the orchards are now. Um, we only had th that stuff, you know, what half of it maybe, not even all of it. So I had to wait, and I had to plant in an area I really didn't want to plant in, but that was it, and that's this area right over here. This is wet ground. You can see this was a pond that drains here, so it's pretty much at the bottom, but fenced it off and said, okay, I'm going to give it a try. So that's where I started off. So the first thing I did, the yellow boundary, was to put up a deer fence, <clears throat> and I planted my rows of trees in there. And I put up trellises, and I did the things that you do, but water was a problem. These were all dwarf trees, and driving back and forth with barrels of water and lowering a hose to water each tree was really labor intensive. It was very time consuming <clears throat> and I used a lot of water and it just made things worse. So I really needed to make it easier. I needed to come up with a better plan. So I put in, in buried in red, you see there is a buried pipe called a manifold and coming off the manifold are rows of drip lines that dripped water to all the trees. That helped a lot, but it helped, wasn't done. And what wasn't done was I was still hauling barrels of water down to water the trees. But this is irrigation verse 1.0, which is always flawed but it was really a huge leap for me. Now, in this picture, you can see the buried manifold and the risers coming up to the drip lines. And I did something stupid, a couple things stupid. One, it was a PVC pipe, but you see the drip lines actually go right through the trellis post. That was a really dumb idea. We'll get more on that later. But I was hauling two 55-gallon drums of water taken from a stamp pipe in the barn, which came off the house well. And then I was using <clears throat> a Harbor Freight generator to run a Harbor Freight shallow well pump to pump the water into the manifold. And that goes off camera here, but there's a stand pipe that it pushed it down and it went up. And it worked really well. Now, the only thing is I only could water two rows at a time for that little pump to keep up and I had to make three trips with the barrels to keep filling it. So it was still a lot of work but it was way more efficient and faster because I could actually sit and read a book or listen to the radio or do something else while the water was moving. So it, it was an improvement but there was still work. Again the YPVC not very consistent you know, very amateur. I was an amateur. So there you have it. So there's the PVC riser sticking up out of the grass. Little pigtail of orchard tubing, an inline valve. And that, of course, makes it possible to determine how much you're going to water at once, especially because I had a limited water supply. <clears throat> I couldn't pump a lot at once, so I only could feed two lines at a time. One of the problems with the PVC pipe is they're brittle and they didn't bend. So if I bumped it with a wheel or with the bucket on the tractor, it was broken. And I was on my hands and knees gluing on a splice or something. So that was a problem. But the real big problem was I just didn't 
have enough water. I was spending too much time running back and forth for water. I needed a reliable water supply. So a neighbor helped me and we tried to put in what's called a sand point to get water from our water table. Now, our water table is kind of weird. We have a shallow layer that's saturated with water, but I wouldn't call it a water table. I would call it high mud. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's high mud. Below that, we go into brown clay, gray clay, and shale. Once you break through the shale, you hit a bona fide aquifer. When we got that point down 25 feet, and it stopped. It refused to go any further. You can see the hole's full of water. That's my high mud. But we couldn't get it down any deeper. It was not going to work. And here's the riser that that garden hose you see goes to to feed up to the trees. Well, the problem was when we said, okay, we can't do it, and we back a tractor up to pull the pipe up, the pipe wouldn't come up. The pipe is still out there. And we're talking about this fall or maybe in August when the ground's really dry so a large tractor can go in there and not worry about rutting it and try and pulling it up with the three-point hitch in the back because it won't budge. <laughs> so, you know, it's a, it was a very significant failure. I got really good at failure. That's failure number one. Failure number two, PVC. PVC is just too brittle for this. It's just not, it's fine for in a house. But two things happened. One, I told you that, you know, you bump, you bump the risers and they snap. But I didn't bury it deep enough. And we had a winter where the temperatures got to 30 below zero Fahrenheit. It was cold. Now, I got all the water out of the pipes. That was never a problem. But what happened was twofold. One, the ground just moved, and that broke pipes. And the other part that happened was, remember I showed you where I put the pipe through the um, trellis post? Well, the trellis posts got pushed up. They're going up. They're pulling the pipe up, but part of the pipe's down in the ground, and they're busting pipes left and right. Now, come spring, when I go to fill this thing with water, I don't know that. That's all under my feet, except I can see that my trellises are whoppy cockered, but I'm not thinking anything of it. And I pressurize the system, and next thing you know, it's kind of like the Beverly Hillbillies, but I had bubbling water all over the place. And I started digging, and this is what I found. Well, <clears throat> it was faster to fix a lousy irrigation system than to rip it out and put in a good irrigation system. So I got on my hands and knees, you pump the water out of the hole or bucket load it out and re-glued all this back together again. <clears throat> and I got all those hoses out of the trellis posts so they're on the side. They can move fairly freely. And I'm still limping on that system now. It's not a great system, but it does work. So... While all this is going on, I've got an order in for a couple hundred trees. And I put up a fence, and I have, this is my aircraft carrier. So you have the crosswind runway, and you have the main runway. Anyway, this is my aircraft carrier orchard. And you can see that there's room for a lot more trees in here that are going to need a lot of water from day one. So while I'm getting this put in at the same time, um, you see the manifolds up here. I needed to be planning and installing and have it the ready for the trees and irrigation system. So the first thing I did was this red line here, that's the old manifold. It stopped right about here, but I put in a whole new buried manifold using ABS pipe. This leg here goes to water the lower section. This leg here goes to water the upper section. And this one goes up and it's got a feed point where I connected in this section, now the, the PVC section. Now the PVC section does have a disconnect. There's a valve there and I'll talk about that later. So if I had another one of those failures there, I could still water all down here. And also I had the well drilled here and we have another video about the well. 
it's a good weld. So now you can see the white lines are all the drip lines, and there's a lot of them. So when the well's running at 20 gallons per minute, I'd say it's running better than a 50% duty cycle. When everything's up and watering at once, it's drinking a lot of water. Now you also notice there's something kind of funky here. This line stops short, and instead of going up to here, it just stops. And I don't remember, I think I hit a really big boulder. I think I was trenching along here and I found a piece of Canada. So what I did is I took this irrigation line and branched off of it. There's a valve here in case there's a problem. There's a valve for this leg and there's a valve for this leg. And that is literally just laying on the ground and I'm feeding those rows of drip line from above the north end. I have been driving over that orchard tubing now for several years, and it's doing fine. So this is a choice you can make if you have to. If you, if you want to, you can just feed it from one and the other. You just want to make sure that you have pressure compensating emitters, and you're at the tail end here, you've got the minimum static pressure so that they're all emitting at the same rate, and it works fine. So that worked out. Now, a little bit about that manifold. I rented a commercial trencher. I was going down, I will say, more than two feet, but it cut, it cut a slit trench that was maybe three inches wide, very narrow trench, and I dropped in this ABS manifold. Now, this is a 100 PSI pipe, more than adequate for what I'm doing. It'll, give, it'll take a little of the pressure... I'm putting 30 PSI into it, which is a regulated pressure off of my, my well. It's not delivering 30 PSI at the far end of the other orchard, but those pressure compensating emitters don't care. They don't need that much pressure. But this can handle the volume of water I need to keep flowing. Now, this section, when I originally dropped the well pump, and this is on the well pump also, I lowered it awfully low, and I was below the casing. Now, if you know something about wells, you put a metal casing down partway, and then they keep drilling, and the water comes up. Well, you could lower the pump down, but with our mud and shale, if that well, the walls had collapsed, I would have lost my pump. It would have been trapped, and it would have clogged with silt. So I raised the pump up to just above the bottom of the casing, and I had this pipe left over. Well, I paid for it. I might need it. So I didn't want to lose it, and I didn't have any place to put it. So when I got it, it came with storage caps. I put the caps on the end, and I just leave it there in the tall grass. It's really important if you do this, put caps on the end because mice and voles will put their houses inside the pipes. They will die, and they will foul your pipe. It is very, very gross. I had other short sections of pipe out there. I'm not even going to tell you the stories, but they all ended up in the dumpster. It was nasty. So cap your surplus pipe. But 100 PSI, inch and a quarter, ABS, seriously handles the flow of my system. I have no problems with a short, low pressure at another end and not getting a good flow rate through my emitters. Now, I mentioned that I had a transition between the one orchard and the other. So there's a pipe running here under the fence joining the manifold, picking it up where it's in the aisle. You can see it rises. There's a cap here, and there's intentionally there's a T on this end. The reason being is if I close this valve and I want to blow the water out, I just pull this cap off, and then I'll, then I'll clear this section exclusively. Then I can put the cap back on and open this valve and start blowing air through it to get the water out the other end. But there's two unions here for the valve, and that's really important too because if I wanted to replace, and I do want to replace the other irrigation system with the new manifold, I just have to buy one union set, put it on the other end, and now I can connect up to a new pipe, and I don't have to redo all this plumbing over again. 
you know, it just makes things a lot more efficient. This is a ball valve because I really just need it on and off. I'm not trying to regulate the flow. I just want the flow open or close. Now to let you see how that, that hooks up in the grand scheme of things, water's coming from the well here. This is 330 feet from here to here. That's 330 feet. It's got a T, goes underneath the fence. That was fun. And you saw that riser there. And that riser connects to this buried line and keeps going out to the end. And earlier you saw that other pipe there. That's where I fed the water in. Well, I put a cap on it. And in the winter now, when it's time to drain the system down, I take the cap off and I progressively push high volume compressed air through the system to force all the water out section by section until I'm pushing water out this end. I also take off the uh, end caps off the end of all the irrigation lines to blow the water out of those lines, close them again to keep bugs from moving into the pipes, and then I'm blowing air to get the water out of the emitter so it doesn't crack the emitters. So it's all part of a maintenance plan. Now, the I did I really did everything as well as I could afford. <laughs> And one thing that was really important was I did not use those kind of clamps you buy and you tighten them with a screwdriver with a worm on them. Those are not the best and actually end up costing you more to begin with anyway, and they're a lot of labor. These are Oedeker clamps, and that's a style of clamp. They're sized very precisely to the pipe, and they're stainless steel. So I use stainless steel Oedeker clamps, and I have the tool for it, and Everything got double clamped, everything underground, everything above ground. There are some things down by the wellhead. There's Oedeker clamps sunk in concrete. I never want to see those again. I don't want them to fail. I don't want them to rust. I don't want problems. And I have a lot of confidence that this plumbing system will outlive me. So uh, I do recommend that you invest in the hardware and know how to use it. Um, use Oedeker clamps. Now, if you say, well, what do I do? How do I take them off? You, you stick a screwdriver in here, a flathead, and you pop it up, and it will uncouple from these little clips, and then you can just take the clamp off. So it's very strong in use. It's also serviceable. They're actually easier to get off than the worm gears because you don't have to back them up forever, and they've gummed up with dirt or something. They're better. So... There you have it. Now let's look at the ABS risers. Two Oedeker clamps for that. This is a half-inch pipe instead of an inch and a quarter. And that's quite simply for the convenience of mating up to the half-inch orchard tubing. I don't need that flow rate, but that's the common affordable size of orchard tubing. Enough said. These are twist-on clamp fittings. Really easy to take on and off by hand. No special tools. Really easy. And a, a gate, a ball valve. Just open and close the row as needed. What's really nice is if I yank this drip line to line up the emitters and I'm torquing on this, it's not going to break this ABS line. The ABS just bounces. If I hit it with the wheel on the tractor, cut and turn, it just bounces. They don't break. And yes, it goes down two and a half feet. It goes onto a T on the inch and a quarter manifold and, again, double Oedekers on everything. So there's no leakage. It's snug. Now, what's down those rows, you ask? I'm glad you asked. Is These are Netafim pressure compensating emitters. And these are, their rate is 4 liters per hour. Call it a gallon four liters per hour. And you can see that they just kind of put out a pulse of water. If they fail, maybe a freeze, I didn't get it right, they'll squirt. If you, you punch a hole with a special tool, you punch a hole in the tubing, and these snap into that hole, and they seal very well. If you mess it up, water will squirt all over the place, and you have to put in a splice. It's not a big deal. These are on a, a wire to keep them above the ground so I can get underneath them. Uh, nice fancy little clips work very well. I used 
Toro brand tubing. It's got a blue line on it. That's one of their trademark things. What's really nice about that blue line is when you're popping your emitters in, you get them all in a nice row. Then you pressurize it with water and you let it sit for a day or two in the sun. And then you can go twist it all and you get them all aiming in the same direction because they're not spiraling around the tubing. The tubing is relaxed. They all face in the same direction. It doesn't matter if they shoot out sideways or they shoot down or they shoot up. It doesn't matter. Um, every time you pressurize the system, you're going to see your drip line sag under the weight of the water. And you're going to watch your tube creep one way or another because of the pressure in it. So as you start your irrigation, you're going to want to walk the line very quickly to make sure the emitters are where they belong. Now you'll see this one is over here, and this one's shooting right at the base of the tree. The slide is here because that's a problem. You would need to come up to this row, walk it really quickly, and then you're going to pull the um, drip line, and all those emitters will line back up again so they're equal distant on either side of the trunk. Mine are too close to the trunks. I would say get at least a foot away from the trunk of the tree. Uh, mostly because you want the roots to expand out, those feeder roots, and you're really not encouraging them to spread out if the water's right there. And the other problem being is if you get it too wet here, you're asking for cholera. So there's that. Now, this has been pretty pictures and such. A little bit about the math. You know, first of all, you need to know how much water are you going to need. And if you say, well, I want to put down two gallons a day on my trees. Okay. And you don't want to be there all day. So you might want to say, I want the irrigation round trip to take an hour, maybe. Well, you need to figure out what your volume of water is in gallons per hour. What's available to you? And then... You put the emitters on, and then in my case, there's half, so each one handles half that volume. You, you get the right size emitters to do the job. You might say, well, I don't want two gallons. I want one gallon per tree. Well, you could either run for a shorter period of time, or you can just put smaller emitters on and maybe run more trees at once. Get it? It's kind of checkbook math. You just have to get the big picture on there. In the end, you might have to do one section at a time because you just may not have enough volume of water running to keep the pressure up and across the whole thing at once. Um, because I have a volume tank and it's a captured air volume tank, I can't let that pressure get too low or I'll lose my air capture. So while the pump might deliver the volume, I'll mess up my pressure regulation system. So that's it. Another thing with emitters I don't want to forget to mention is that they need filtered water okay you can't be pumping surface water through a drip system because you will clog those little emitters so and i'm using actual emitters you can also get what's called inline tape you just lay on the ground and the emitters are actually pressure compensating and built into the tubing you can just leave it on the ground and you that can be every two feet every nine inches every foot and then, of course, you calculate, well, what's the water volume for how many, you know, I need to put 100 feet of this. How much water will that whole tape take up? The downside of those is if you have some trees die, you can't put plugs in instead of emitters. You're just going to keep dripping water anyway. If you don't care and you got the surplus of water, that's fine. So one thing on my system also is my pump is rated for 20 gallons per minute, and it is limited to 20 gallons per minute. It actually has a flow restrictor on it. The pump is not as deep as it was designed to go. It's, it's only about 20 feet below the surface, and it will overspeed. I'll burn up the motor. So the manufacturer said, no, you have to put a limiter on there or you'll burn it up. I actually damaged uh, a motor starting system, which I have above ground, so I didn't have to go down for it. And... After doing that, I put a limiter on there, which I found on eBay. And actually, yeah, and it works just fine. But I'm limiting my flow to 20 gallons per minute. Uh, 
a good well will certainly turn out that much water. Um, if you have thousands of trees, you're going to need a bigger well. Okay, and that's where doing the math, talking to the person who drills your well, you might need more than one well. And if you remember, I have a generator out all summer long dedicated to running my well. So that's a thing. Well, I hope this has been enlightening. I hope it's been a good story. I could no way, the other day I ran the irrigation for an hour. Okay, every tree, I mean, it's hot here. It's in the 90s Fahrenheit. It's very warm. 30-something centigrade Celsius. Uh, I, I ran it for an hour. I mean, I just can't imagine hand-watering or hauling barrels of water to do all of those trees. Certainly, I would still have, if I didn't have a well, I would certainly have a manifold and something to help distribute the water consistently and predictably. I would probably have to get a bitter, bigger, we call them a water buffalo, a water wagon, because it would take forever to fill it, and they would weigh a lot. But it's an option, you know, kind of like a water. If you, if you have a well that can't provide enough water at once, you might get water tanks to fill up in advance and then pump from the tanks while the well's keeping up with you, just so you can get it done. There's some choices there. So, well, that's the story of the irrigation system at Happy Dog Farm, mostly the manifold and the drip lines and the evolution. And you saw my mistakes. I was shameless. I just told you about them. So if you liked it at all, please give it a thumbs up. I, I really appreciate that. Please subscribe. Subscribers help me. Thank you. And if you have questions, constructive criticism, please share. Put them in the comments. I, I'd like to hear it. So... Thank you very much. It's been nice chatting with you and you have a nice evening.